Yeah. Or wherever you went. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our next uh, breakout session. This is going to be a really fun discussion. Um, I'm not going to take too much time. I'm just going to go ahead and introduce the very awesome editor in chief of Eight Asians, Ms. Jocelyn White. So we, uh, um, we want to talk right now about uh, getting beyond stereotypes in the media. And you know, like Jeff talked this morning, he said, we don't want, we're not here to whine, we're not here to complain. We've kind of identified some of the stereotypes that are out there. So we're here with a bunch of smart people, and we're going to use our smarts and try to talk about like, what's the next step, what can we do? Let's take a little bit of action here um, beyond you know, the talk. So um, before I introduce the panel, I want to know a little bit about you guys in the audience. So yeah. before you settle down too, uh -uh. too long, um, I'd like to ask you to stand up if you're having a great conference so far. If you're what? Having a great conference so far. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so stand up if you do not consider yourself Asian American. If you are not Asian American, let's see who you are here in the room. I see some of you. Interesting. You're not Asian American? <laughs> not, not. Not, not. No, we want to see because, you know, this is the thing. Okay, great. Okay, Tiffany. <laughs> I want to see if you are under the age of 25. Stand up if you're under the age of 25. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> totally. Thank you for being here, young and energetic folk. Um, stand if you are female. Nice. Okay. Stand if you traveled more than 50 miles to be here today. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. And since we're talking about stereotypes in the media, stand if you consider yourself a member of the media. Media. I mean, journalist? You're talking about journalist? journalist? If you're a member of the media, however you define that. Uh -uh. All right. Stand if you think, you know, with all this stuff that we're talking about, is it getting better for us? Stand if you think it's getting better. Yeah, um, Very interesting. <laughs> All right, last question now. I want you to stand if you have a burning topic that you want this panel to discuss. I think some of you may have seen the seen the um, our bios. Anybody have a burning topic that you want us to discuss today? Stand. Tell us what it is, and I will work it in quickly. Though. In the portrayal of um, queer Asian Americans. Okay. Anyone else still standing? All right. We'll make sure we cover. Oh, there's one more. I want to ask you before, so that we don't run out of time later. Um, I think for me it would be the topic of undocumented Asian Americans. Okay. I'm undocumented myself, and it's kind of like really difficult, like having no other Asian American undocumented people out um, in the media. Okay. Anyone is still standing? All right. With Without further ado, oh, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, the intersections between race, class, and media. So, how do you mitigate the class issues, or what are some of the things that have been boundaries, and how have you been able to overcome them, either in representation or in just like your own work yourself? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. We've got some, some three um, things that I will definitely hit, and then hopefully we'll have time for more Q and A. Um, as Keith said, my name is Jocelyn Wang. Some of you may know me as Jaws. Um, I am very honored to be here to moderate this panel, this really distinguished panel. Let me quickly introduce them. To my left is Jerry Mahi's art director of Shattered. Um, amongst other things, he designs um, a lot of movie posters. Um, we have Jude Narita to his left. Uh, she's a theater artist and activist. Of the latest one of the, her known works is From the Heart. To her left is Patrick Aquino. And to his left is Stephen DiBianco. They're both of the National Film Society and also the hosts of the PBS Online Film Festival. Going down the line, Steve Wen of Channel APA. And lastly, on the end, Brian Hu, Artistic Director of the Pacific Arts Movement, the organizers of the San Diego Asian Film Festival. So let's just give them a quick round of applause and let me know. As we start talking about today, and I'm not going to talk that much longer, I um, just want to set the stage. We've already talked uh, earlier today of just, you know, are these stereotypes necessary? What are they? 
Um, we also talked about some of the history. And um, before, I'm not going to ask a question and ask every panelist to answer. I'm just going to pose a couple questions and then open it up to discussion. But I know that Jude has a very interesting historical perspective. And I thought um, maybe she could kick it off and um, give some um, perspective as to what it's been like over the years. Um, she's been doing it a little bit longer than some of us in, in terms of her activism in theater. So um, I'd love to hear from her right now. Sure. So about over 25 years ago, when I started um, in theater writing solo work, one of the reasons I started was because the images that were out in film and television were very generic and one-dimensional. And an Asian woman was small, fair, a flower, submissive, or a dragon lady, but small. small. And so if I went in on audition, I would you know, say, yeah, I ate all the rice in the village. That was me. You know, because I'm big, I'm a tall person. And this was hard for people to wrap their heads around, so I started writing solo work. But I tried to be really specific because the images that I would see, I wanted to see my dads, or people's dads, and brothers, and grandfathers, and I wanted to see some, some good guys up there. I wanted to see some good women up there. And, but I also started taking images that existed, like a Vietnamese bar girl prostitute, a mail order bride, um, you know, quiet, don't rock the boat, Nisei, uh, and I dealt with racism and global war and, and, everything that, and, and everything that that entails and how women become just chattel and they become, uh, you know, disposable. And, and since war is generation, has been generational in Asia, meaning somebody's great-grandfather, somebody's grandfather, somebody's father, your brother, your husband, your son could all have fought in Asia. So what does the enemy look like? Okay, we got it, we got it. In that family, me and somebody who looks like me is the enemy. And so, you know, it's trying to break that and humanize. And I think people on earlier panels also said this, humanizing, uh, humanizing images that exist. Not, I took, first I started out by taking images that existed and made them human. And the really hard one was the Vietnamese bar girl prostitute. Because I, having grown up in America and watched TV, thought, what is the matter with those women? Why don't they get a better job? You know, and I, I didn't understand about how an economy gets destabilized and how people's value, how what's valuable, what you get money for in a war-torn country. So you, um, you mentioned, sorry, I don't interrupt, but you mentioned something really interesting, which is humanizing people. And you also mentioned something about bad guys, which I think is a really good segue okay. to our, our friends here at the National Film Society, who also, do you want to tell us about your project? Sure. <clears throat> so we're making, um, uh, Patrick and I are making a web series called Awesome Asian Bad Guys. And uh, it's a project that kind of was born out of, you know, us talking about when we were growing up in the 80s and 90s, and you know, always seeing these same actors who would just be in these action movies playing bad guys, and they would come out and they would go fight against you know the hero, and they look you know really intimidating, really tough, but then they would just die within like seconds, you know, and it was like, oh man, that guy's gonna be awesome, and then he just died, and so uh, so our idea was like, hey, let's do something sort of like The Expendables, where we get some sort of you know, people who were in action movies from like the 80s and 90s and put them together. But instead, uh, we'll just focus on Asian bad guys. And so, yeah, so we're making this project and the idea is to really, um, you know, take these guys who were very like one dimensional, um, whose only job was to show up and get killed uh, and, you know, tell their stories. And I think that's a good place for Jerry to, to mention, because I know Jerry, although I introduced him as the art director of Shattered, he also has a lot of knowledge about martial arts in the cinema and comics. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, those portrayals of our mar the, the martial artist stereotype. I mean, that's one that we all know and love, right? <laughs> well, the, the martial artist stereotype actually probably isn't even all that bad of one for us, you know? <laughs> um, but from my experience uh, working in comics, uh, I do independent books, and uh, I first started off with my brothers doing a book about Asian uh, martial artists and gangsters, and we've been approached by numerous Hollywood uh, studios to create a live action film out of it. And every time I was told, you know, it was important for me and my brothers to have Asian leads, Asian heroes, and every studio that spoke to us, I mean, they were dropping big names on us, like. You know, Brad Pitt, Mark Wahlberg, Johnny Depp. Um, but they're like, you know, the bad guy, he can be Asian. 
the girlfriend, she can be Asian, but they're like the hero. And they literally told me, like, come on, man, you got to know better than that. He's got to be, you know, he can't be Asian, you know? And I was just like, oh, uh, you know, like, it's a Chinatown story. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know how it's going to work with Johnny. I mean, Johnny Depp's got dark hair. I get it, but, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, it was a really difficult situation for me and my brothers to be in because uh, we had to decide whether we were going to, you know, sell out or keep our integrity. And, um, well, we, we, you know, we decided to keep our integrity and just, you know, hope that a good story is going to be a good story no matter, and hopefully uh, sometime down the road it might catch on a little more. And so, you know, we've been talking about it here um, just today is kind of the portrayals of Asians in media. We know Hollywood is a big driver of a lot of the content out there, and that's a lot of kind of the complaining that's happened in the past. But um, I, I want Brian to talk a little bit about the, the independent film festivals, the independent voice, how Asian Americans have been claiming their own voices and, uh, and portrayals. Well, I mean, this is nothing new. Uh, Asian Americans have been making films since the silent days. Um, in the 70s, it kind of blew up. And today, with digital media, like, everyone is a filmmaker, um, whether they should be or not. Um, and what's really kind of strange to me, though, is that it doesn't mean that there's been an explosion of different kinds of voices or different kinds of stories. Um, one of my dreams is to get all of the Asian American film festival programmers together and make a pie chart of all the genres that we get. You'd be surprised. It's we get like 60% romantic comedies, um, and like movies about 20-year-olds in and out of love, and that's about it. And that's uh, we could talk. That's a, maybe a separate conversation. But that's these are the kind of things that I'm noticing about like what the state of either the state of Asian American filmmaking or the voice that a lot of young people are trying to claim as say dif different from what came before, which might have been the martial arts uh, prototype or archetype. Well, for one, to add to his point, there have been a lot of the same kind of genres and movies that have kind of tried to replicate themselves over and over and try to reinvent the whole theme of, I guess, romantic comedies because they try to steer so far away from, you know, the stereotypical Asian American roles or whatever. So, you know, I think um, for me personally, the ones that find their voice out there are the ones that are comfortable with their identity and also the ones that kind of know how to mold that into something that they can identify with themselves so that when other people see that, they can identify as like, oh, you know, I'm kind of like that guy too. So I don't know if you guys watch Vice or documentaries or YouTube stuff, but I, I'm a fan of that stuff. And I'm seeing a lot of these human stories and how they can connect to people, you know, of every audience, whatever, regardless of age, skin, you know, race, anything. And one, one series I really love is Eddie Wong's Fresh Off the Boat. You know, I don't know if you guys know of Eddie Wong, but he wrote a document, or he wrote a memoir, Fresh Off the Boat. He is a restaurateur of a Bauhaus, and that guy just challenges stereotypes just like nothing, and he is just so awesome and innovative, and he really speaks to like a lot of the 80s babies and 90s babies growing up who kind of um, saw their identity as kind of like, well, I fit in this archetype of the Asian American uh, whatever it may be. So, you know, and I think a lot of people who find their voice through, you know, just whatever it may be, whether it be like, you know, art, film, cooking, you know, anything, it's, it's a treasure. It's something you should really definitely take a look at and admire. And I think the more and more voices we see out there, it's gonna be just, you know, it's just gonna be a slowly changing the landscape of just the independent and mainstream media. So I feel that there's, like, I hear a few things right now. Um, I hear that there are more voices that are happening with the explosion of di digital media. People are taking their own voices. But at the same time, I hear it's the same genres. Um, are we telling the same stories over and over? Are we perpetuating the stereotype? Well, there are the same plots. But as far as stories go or perpetuating a, a stereotype, um, once you humanize a stereotype, then it's a human being. All a stereotype is to me is that there's groups of people from the same area that have the same mannerisms or the same dialect, but what's been robbed from them or ripped from them is like Jack said earlier, their family, their, their humanity, their love, their humor. So what you have is a shell, and a shell is very easy to mock because it's illogical. 
it's, uh, it's not understandable. It's not human. But it can be the same story, but why should, why should I always have to identify with, you know, a story about some white people or other colors that, um, that are in love or that are struggling with love or that are trying to find themselves or trying to find their lost whatever. When I could see an Asian face 50 feet tall, the first time I saw that in, um, it was a, a documentary about the 442 um, Battalion, I, I, it made me weep. I actually saw it down at the Japan American. Because, and the person I was with couldn't understand that. And I said, it's just, it's just, it looks like my uncle. It's just like this big, big Asian face that's so familiar. And, he, and he's a soldier and he's not doing, you know, he's just standing there weeping because the war is over. And what they went through. They weren't part of the crowd that was cheering that the war was over. They were weeping because they'd lost so many people. It was so moving to me. So why shouldn't, I understand, I truly think there's just so many stories and plots, but when they're filled with different faces, we grow up, we, uh, when I grew up, there was nothing. So when you see yourselves as a younger person, then you, you are validated, you are visible, and that's so important. So, so let's I talk think about it's, visibility. Yeah. That's part of this, right? It's it's not just what is the stereotype, but when there are when there are visible moments for Asian Americans in whatever portrayal that it is, it's that there are not that many of them. I mean, frankly, that's that's part of the problem, right? right. So, how do we fix this issue of visibility? How how can we, as um, either people who consume media or people who are creating media, be part of the part of the solution? Well, I think everybody that is connected to technology, everyone that kind of knows their place and wants to be able to be one of those people to create something, whether it be like a film or music or whatever, I think has to speak, has to transcend those barriers that are set in place. And, you know, we have to confront these archetypes and say, this is what we want to be as just an individual and hopefully it just catches on to, you know, like the people that we know to this day, like they're trying to probably like, you know, create their own works of art and trying to express themselves beyond a certain point. And these guys here, are, you know, the National Film Society, obviously they're doing something that, you know, they've wanted to do. And I think it resonates throughout the whole entire uh, spectrum of the independent film scene that, you know, this web series is going to identify with people who watched a lot of the 80s, you know, um, cinema out there with, uh, I guess, you know, the karate and all that stuff. Uh, it, it's kind of like bringing it back and reinventing it. And I think reinventing your voice and reinventing your identity is always going to be something that people will see. It will be a visible thing. It will make splashes out there. And a lot of people will definitely want to say, you know, hey, you know, I can relate to this. I want to, I want to do something similar to this. And you know, I think everyone out there wants to kind of understand kind of like where this is going. You know, we don't know yet. We don't know where this is going. But right now, like we may not think we're as visible as most people think we are. You know, it's, it's not very understood exactly what our place is. And, you know, to me, I don't think we should worry about like what our place is. And it's just creating and keep creating. And hopefully that we can understand where we are to the point where like other people can comment and you know, it's all about curation. It's all about curation in whatever we do, in film and whatever. It has to be correctly curated and it has to make sense to people outside of this broad spectrum of the Asian American community. Otherwise, it's always just gonna be about us talking about us and people are not, people outside of this spectrum aren't gonna see what we see, you know? So I think you have to create stuff that speaks outside, you know, to the outside of that community. So, you know, that's why Hollywood may not understand exactly where we're at right now because, you know, although we are a growing community, one of the fastest growing communities actually right now, they still don't exactly know how to identify with us in particular, mainly because we haven't, I guess, made ourselves relatable enough to so them. So is this so. our problem? Is this something that we can change? I mean... It's the landscape. It's the landscape of what it is. You know, we're still young, we're still growing. And, you know, like... It's going to happen soon. I mean, you're not going to see it all happen at once. I mean, slowly. Jeremy Lin is breaking in okay. to the, you know, the sports scene. Far East Movement and Asiatics that just got signed to, um, what was it, Little Wayne? Was it Little Wayne or something? Or Birdman's? 
Yeah. Label, like, you know, like, it's happening slowly, you know, like we can't expect a big change to happen all at once. Visibility will come with time. And of course, with the right mentality and with the, the right content, right? So, you know, it's just gonna happen, it's gonna take time. But I'm noticing everywhere in fabrication, like design, architecture, film, art, it's happening. Yeah. It, it is happening. And you know, in Jude's day and age, it was definitely, you know, it wasn't there at one point, now it is. It's starting to come up and I think, you know, for a veteran such as yourself, and an activist who's been trying to push this, you've obviously kind of noticed the movement and growing trends in sure, Asian yeah. faces. Yeah, and I think, I think it's such an important step to where like we all have the technology and resources to create our own you know, content. It's, you know, there's no limit to what we can do. So everyone here with a cell phone, anyone that runs a blog, I mean, you guys all have a voice. It's, yes. it's crazy, and all of you make a difference whether or not you believe it or not. It's, it's just the way it is. Stephen Patrick, you guys have stepped up. I mean, you guys haven't really been making the films that you've been making all that long, right? Right. I think, uh, right, so part of this change is, is like just the world, right? So the world's changing, and technology's changing, and so getting our voices heard, and um, you know, Hollywood, and to independent creators, and you know, having these new uh, portrayals get out there, uh, it's, part of, it's part of this changing world. So when I was growing up, you know, the TV had 13 channels. And, you know, if you didn't have cable, then you had 13 channels, right? And, you know, my brothers, I, was really, I really don't like scary movies because they scare me. So <laughs> my brothers, you know, we, they would say if, if there was, like, some scary movie on HBO or Showtime or something, they'd be like, okay, if you're not good, we're going to change it to the scary movie channel. And then, like, there probably is a scary movie channel now. <laughs> like, there wasn't really a scary movie channel when I was a kid. But so... But what I'm saying is like basically so there's like all this choice, you know, now more than ever before. It's like you could be here or you could be at a movie or at a sports game or, you know, on a YouTube channel or reading a blog or whatever. And so, you know, instead of like I heard something recently where it was like, you know, back in the whatever 50s or 60s when you had a television show, you didn't have to have like the greatest show ever. You just had to be better than like the other couple channels that was out there. And so, you know, now there's so much choice and there's opportunity for independent creators like us to, to share our perspective. Um, and, you know, part of it is, yes, you know, we have the tools to go out and make it, and, but the other half of it is, you know, uh, will there be people there to support that work and, you know, who demand that work? And, you know, we were really fortunate. We did this Kickstarter for our web series and there's people here who contributed. Thank you so much. Um, and we raised over fifty thousand dollars for our, to to shoot this, you know, small, you know, web series about awesome Asian bad guys, and you know, I'm sure that that that's just the beginning. That there's plenty of opportunities for people to say, hey, I want to do something. Uh, let me figure out how I can get the support of the community and get this story, this idea out there. Yeah, and like I think also it's like uh, who was that Nigerian writer that died a couple days ago? Right, and there's that quote. Um, uh, if you don't like other people's stories, tell your own. And I think a lot of filmmakers that I kind of grew up with or, or that um, started the same around the same time, it was like, okay, we're gonna do that, you know. And so people were looking for particular types of stories, especially from like uh, amongst Asian American filmmakers. <coughs> but all that stuff is still it's still true, right? Like it's just different formats. Like whether it be a blog or whatever, it's like you tell your stories, and everybody has the ability to do that. And then like if you're good, and if you connect with other people, and it resonates then it's fair game, you know what I mean? Whether it be a web series and all this other stuff. And I think for, for, uh, for Steve and I, it was like, okay, we found something that kind of, we both kind of clicked on, that um, we're like, you know, nobody's ever talked about these dudes before. They always talk about the long duck dongs of the 80s and 90s and stuff. But I was like, what about these dudes that were in the movies for like two minutes before getting like electrocuted and stuff? <laughs> um, these guys are awesome. And so like, uh, I, think, I think that for us is something that we, we were like, we want to make something about this, and then we realized that, you know, people were down with that too, and um, they all remembered them, you know what I mean? And, and that's what made this really, like, fun and made us really want to kind of go forward with it because it, it just started clicking, you know? It was nice to hear what you guys um, clicked on, and I was talking to Brian earlier, um, just after lunch, because um, in his role as artistic director at the San Diego Asian Film Festival, you know, he sees a lot of films. He sees a lot of films that are made by Asian Americans. I asked him, um, what kinds of things is he seeing? What are the stories we are telling either about ourselves or just in general when he's currently looking at the trends and what's being submitted to him? 
Um, well, I think what I mentioned to you was that we actually, stereotypes come up a lot in Asian American filmmaking. Um, but what I've seen is that I get a lot of short films, and the short films are often just hinged on a hook or on some kind of twist at the end. You know, it's only seven minutes long at the end of some kind of funny twist. And they're all about stereotypes. They're all about um, that guy you thought was the meek Chinese man turns out to be the, the charming whatever. Um, it's just always that hook, that, that twist. Um, we get a lot of them, and they're not really that as interesting as the filmmakers think. But it's sort of like our, our ideas of stereotypes also remain rather simplistic. Um, it's like we took a couple Asian American studies classes and we think that we're experts at um, Asian American representation and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not, if you've made one of those films before, so that's, 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 that's okay. Um, you're, you're on the right track. Um, but but I, I, I guess what I'd like to do is um, pro provide some counterexamples to what I see. Um, I, I, first of all, there's some filmmakers now who just don't even, like they didn't take Asian American studies classes and they don't really have that kind of consciousness and that's fine. Um, someone like Kevin Jumba, when, he, when I watched his early stuff, his web videos, and his dad comes on in the background, who in many ways is a stereotype of an Asian dad, he's hilarious because he's humanized. Um, and when we see enough of him, then you realize, sure, that could be a stereotype, but it's all, it, could be, it could be something more. And it's because the attitude of the, the work doesn't seem to be so kind of anxious about stereotypes. But otherwise, I see films like, um, there's a film that's going to come out soon called Abigail Harm. Um, I'm told it's going to play at an LA film festival coming up very soon. Um, it's directed by Lee Isaac Chung, who's one of the, the great Asian American filmmakers. And one of the characters in it is this, in many ways, he's a stereotypical, perpetual foreigner, like Asian. He barely talks. Um, he doesn't seem to have any personality. Yet there's something so magical about the style of the film and the representation, the attitude towards him, that it kind of just makes the stereotype not the, the, the conversation anymore. Um, I like to say that we like to play with stereotypes, but let's put the emphasis on the play, and not on the stereotypes. Let's have fun, and let's make movies that are kind of exciting and unusual, and that kind of creates like a mysticism. Not mysticism, that's the wrong word, that's stereotypical too. <laughs> but like, like an, an artistry. Um, and and so let's put our emphasis on that. And then but that, that's what I think the National Film Studies done so well. They, they're focused on their humor um, and, and the craft. I mean, many of you don't know, they went to film school. They aren't just two guys who had cameras. <laughs> like, we, we keep talking about the technology. It's like, as if suddenly everyone is going to be a brilliant filmmaker with a voice that that is worth talking about, but they, they put in their work. They know how to make films, and they've created an aesthetic that, that fits their voice. Um, so, I don't know, I, I guess to the Asian American, I, I see a lot of films that are um, kind of cognizant of stereotypes, but like, I, I want to see filmmakers who actually know how to make films, I guess, that's the point. Just, just one thing, like, as an independent creator, I think it's almost wrong to go out and try to break the stereotype. I almost feel like you'll break the stereotype if, if you keep the story personal. You know, if it's personal to you, then generally, generally, the story's gonna be, you know, a little more humanized, a little, a little bit better, uh, and I think when you make it personal, other people are gonna relate to it, and once you do something like that, it will, you know, either create or break stereotypes, you know? I just don't think you can go out and be like, all right, I'm gonna make every Asian guy huge and tough and strong, and you know, every white guy's gonna be, you know, short and dumb. You know, <laughs> you know like I just, I just don't think, it, you know, like you can't do that. Like, but if you just do it, like everyone knows, a smart whatever or a dumb whatever or an athletic whatever, you know. Um, so if you just tell it, and, and I think people can relate to it if it's a more realistic, humanized, personal story, you know. <laughs> You know, not everybody can make films, um, but so I'm speaking more from the theater aspect of how I've noticed a huge movement of individual of solo work. And um, I'm, in, I'm also involved with the LA Women's Theater Festival, where I should be, but I'm not, because I'm here. Um, and it, it's just the work, you know, because when somebody steps on stage, you can't help it, but you start to, you, definitions start coming in your mind of that person, what that person is. And then they start to speak, and they're, and they're, they speak from their heart on stage. And it's just, it, they just become just so um, beautiful, just so attractive, just so alive. And they're speaking things that you know about, and then they're speaking things that you don't know about. And it's just amazing. I think, I think theater, is a, is a good segue between life and film because you can afford theater. You th anybody can afford theater to, to put up a show. And, it, and anybody can write something and can read from their journal, can write, read a poem. But it's just like, it's just amazing the creativity and the voice that is striving to get out. 
And in these, in these open mic sessions, these uh, festivals, these theater festivals, these women festivals, just every, all these festivals that allow new voices to um, present themselves on stage, you know, it's just phenomenal. So I, I, I just am amazed and I'm encouraged, I'm inspired, I'm challenged, I'm, I'm just encouraged by the work that's coming out on stage. I just want to say that. I want to start, I want to turn the table a little bit here, and I want to address those three topics that were burning areas, because I know, like, we don't have a say about what's being uh, set up here, so I wanted to give the audience a chance to, to really talk about some of the things that were coming up. And one of the things that was mentioned was race, class, and media, mm -hmm. those intersections. Like, we're, we're, you know, let's be honest here, you know, there's certain, certain people who have the luxury of working in media, even though it's not easy, even though it's not hard, um, you know, there are people who are invisible because they don't have a voice. So let's talk about those intersections of race, class, and media. Where, where, where do we fall short in, in moving those conversations ahead? I see Brian. Well, I would start with class. I don't think Asian American filmmakers at least talk about class. A lot of it has to do with the fact that after Better Luck Tomorrow broke, everyone wants to make a crossover film. And by crossover film, it means you make a middle class movie. Uh, you make a movie that's a middle to upper class. Um, the nuclear family, it looks like the Cosby show all of a sudden. Um, and in the 90s, movies weren't, like the Asian American films weren't like that. Um, class was a big part of it. And I'm thinking about like, recent Asian American films, which ones talked about class difference in the Asian American community? I can only think of Bang Bang. Um, some of you may have seen that. That's the one about the Taiwanese parachute kid and then the Vietnamese gangsters that he hangs out with. Otherwise, class is not talked about in Asian American filmmaking, period. Except for documentaries. But in narrative films, it's not. And that's a huge problem. And seriously, if anyone makes one, I will, there's a very good chance I'm going to take it into our festival. <laughs> Just because we're hungry for movies that tackle the difference, especially because as the model, so-called model minority, we often perpetuate this ourselves by talking about us as upper middle class people in our, product, our cultural production, mm -hmm. even our independent cultural production. And that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. I see some nodding, and it's actually going to lead into the other two topics that were burning issues, at the portrayal of um, queer Asian Americans and also undocumented Asian Americans. Um, I know that you, on this um, panel, we may or may not have any expertise on this, but let's talk about some of these things that we're not hearing, because you just said yourself, um, we see the upper middle class, that's one of the things that is not being addressed. Um, what can we do better? Um, on queer representations, I mean, we got a lot of it out of, after like, the wedding banquets and then saving face. I think it naturally lended itself really well to one of the other uh, genres of Asian American filmmaking, which is the intergenerational film, like parents and their kids. And then um, the, the gay child became such a perfect way and like pa powerful way of talking about intergenerational conflict. Um, but that's like, the, <laughs> that's like the only, one of the very few narratives that we get of um, LGBT characters in Asian American films. So I challenge the filmmakers to uh, go beyond that as well. Although, um, for those of you who haven't seen it, to me, the, the most important Asian American film in recent years is called In the Family. Um, a pro powerful three hour document, not document, narrative film uh, set in Tennessee about um, an a, a Asian American man um, whose partner dies and he's trying to fight for custody of his white son. Um, it, it's extremely powerful, and it's, that's the kind of thing that needs more visibility, I think. What about this issue of, and, and this is one that we know is not just a a political hot topic, but you know, it's well, when we hear about undocumented um, people, first of all, it's sometimes not directed towards our community, even though we know this is an issue that is affecting our community. But secondly, it's there, there's a there's also I think the reason we don't talk about uh, undocumented people within our community is because there's an element of fear here, and I think a lot of what we're talking about is kind of fear to speak up, and maybe that's something that that we need to do as a community. I'm, I'm, looking, at, I'm looking at the panel to see who who's, who's, uh, has anything to say on this. Well, you know, as, as a, one of the editors of Secret Identities, uh, you know, we were constantly criticized for all the different genres we had left out of our book. And really, the truth is, we're a victim of our submissions, you know? We had an open call for everyone. We put it out there, we, we, you know, we did the media blast, everything. And we can't, you know, we can only choose what we get, you know, and if those, you know, we would love to tell those stories, but we can't tell, you know, there's only four people, we can't tell everything on our own. We need everyone's help. So I would just say, if you feel like those stories are being left out, 
then, you know, tell them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the same thing with anything. It's like, if you want to hear those stories, tell them. People on this panel may not be able to tell those stories as well. So just, I mean, just figure out a way to do it. And plus, like, it's also a, with any kind of, like, uh, creative endeavor or anything with, like, filmmaking or video making, it's like, in general, it's always been, like, people with money can, can do stuff, but now it's not. So just go pump that shit out, you know? I think Jaws makes a good point about the difficulty of visibility in the, in the case of undocumented um, voices. Like, you, maybe you don't want to be seen. But that's when I think you can be really creative with your media making. Um, comics, animation, I mean, that's, that's a really powerful way of not showing your face. Um, but it just, yeah, being creative. And if, if the form doesn't seem to fit your subject, then change the form. Let's, I wanted to make sure that we had some time. I know that we started a little bit later, but um, um, I wanted to open up to the audience for, for questions, and I don't know where the mic is. But I know they, were, they want everything mic. so are there any questions from the audience? Thank you, it's coming with the mic. And when you get the mic, tell us who you are before you ask your question, because I, I kind of want to know who's asking the question. Hi, um, my name is Jess Vu. Uh, thanks for being here at the panel. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, what who what characters do you think in today's mainstream media do you, that you believe are well developed for an Asian American character, and why? Well, I'd really love to answer this. Uh, I mean, I think the the best character we've seen in a long time is Jin from Lost, right? I, I had the honor of like hanging out with Daniel Day Kim. At Sundance and humble brag. No, no. <laughs> you know, just like listening to him and talking to him about it, and he's extremely passionate about it. He he won't take roles that are gonna make Asian people look, you know, poor or, or bad. And uh, I just felt like his character on, on Lost, in my opinion, he was the most developed character, the deepest character. He went through the biggest transformation. You know, um, he was like an amazing character for that show. Any other characters that are stand out? Anything that Ken Leung does. Um, suddenly he's not just a shell. He is, he's just taken over by this incredible actor. So I, I would watch him in anything. Um, I haven't watched this show in a while, but I, Sandra Oh, when, uh, when she first came out, she did a film called um, A Little Bit of Happiness or something. Double Happiness. Double Happiness, which I, I thought was just amazing. You know, it was just wonderful and clever, and uh, it had it. It took me on. It was such a journey. It was such wonderful writing, wonderful acting, and I think that although I so, she plays a woman that I sometimes I don't understand, I would never be. But she plays a complex, sexual, uh, complex character, and she layers it, and and she's abrasive at times. She just does all these things that are just and. A lot of that's her personality, but I mean perhaps. But um, she she's a, a very forward actress, very you know, and I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, and she has uh, she has the great fortune of having worked with the play. The woman who wrote that uh, also wrote a play. I think Stop Kiss was that the she wrote another play. She just uses Sandra a lot in her work, and I think that's the one of the keys is that is that. Um, many people work in partnership with the writer, and they become the the physical form of the writer's work. And it, it, it's a great partnership there. So, All right, we have another question here. What's your name? Uh, my name is Dylan. Um, I have like a question and a comment. Um, I'm undocumented, and I just wanted to say that being undocumented isn't a personal experience; it is a community experience. Um, and it's an issue that needs advocacy by the Asian community because there aren't like mythical communities of undocumented people. When p police and ICE raid communities, they raid communities of color, they raid Latino communities, they raid Asian communities, and they separate Asian families. And so that kind of advocacy, like I think um, immigration needs to be understood as a method by the state to criminalize and incarcerate Asian and Latino and people of color. Like, it is a system that is enacted in order to regulate and criminalize people of color, and that kind of advocacy needs to, be ha needs to occur in the Asian communities, not just in these kind of monolithized, undocumented communities. Um, and so, 
you know, personal experience is very um, important and expressing that is very important, but it also shouldn't just be expected to be addressed by the undocumented people. Um, it has to be addressed by communities of color. Absolutely, and thank you for, for speaking up because, you know, we, we only know our own experiences at first, right? So I'm, I'm actually really impressed by people saying I am undocumented because it's sometimes something that we, that others have the luxury of never having to think about. Certainly, um, and I, I had a question as well, um, just about the Asian Pacific Islander identities. And um, basically, um, that I mean, is forming a, a kind of essentialized Asian Pacific Islander identity necessary? I mean, like we are kind of in the ether in terms of identity, which I don't necessarily see as a bad thing. Um, and you know, like every Asian American book that I read is like there's a disclaimer about from the author that's like, oh, like this is what I mean by Asian American. <laughs> These are the ethnic groups that I mean. Um, but like, is it necessary? To, or, or is it essentializing an Asian American identity? Um, can, can that be dangerous and used for the benefit of white supremacy? Or can it be developed in a way that doesn't create spaces and discourse of exclusion? Wait, what? There, or can an identity be de developed in a way that doesn't create spaces of exclusion? Right. So she's asking questions about Asian American identity, um, about the definitions of these, and, um, and um, you know, is our, is creating an Asian American identity dangerous? Am I mis uh, mis uh, Yeah, is it dangerous or can be used for the benefit of white supremacy when we start trying to essentialize the Asian American identity? Absolutely. Um, and I think that the, the key is to get away from talking about what is Asian American identity, more just talking about the Asian American community as this kind of political force uh, and something that we, that we all have a voice in. Um, so at the film festival, we, one of our goals is to shock people about what Asian American can be and shock them out of their ideas of Asian American as a face that they, that they know. So at our festival, we showed um, this film called Late Summer, an all-black cast set in Tennessee. Happened to have a Korean-American director. We showed it. Um, and the fact that the point is we want people to come to the Asian Film Festival and then be surprised by what Asian American can be. So I think we could, we could still hold on to the idea of Asian American or this label, but just constantly use this as a way of sh surprising people about the diversity and about the kind of porousness. In fact, I mean, mixed race or um, uh, Asian Americans who are adopted, just kind of, kind of break that and break through. It, it's important to remember that Asian American, that word, that phrase has not always existed. That came out of political, student political movements to get Asian American studies, uh, ethnic studies. A lot of it came out of Berkeley, UCLA, you know, the, I, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal that I, th those people are still very active in the communities. But there was a time when that there was no phrase for that, and it's so common to us now. So um, it was used as a rallying cry, and it was, a claimed as a, it was claimed as an identity, you know, as opposed to being something that separated us. It united, and it, 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 it was a political, political choice and a political force. All right, there's a question here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I have a question. I kind of have something I, I kind of want to... Um, I'm Case. I'm a filmmaker. Um, been doing about 12 years, mostly network and studio stuff. And this is something I've kind of been thinking about for a while since I've been in the industry. And I think it's a great place to kind of share it with everyone. It's kind of a call to action. And we have to think media is a business. And it's, a, it's, it's about making money. And when we have something that's racist against African Americans, uh, there's a unified group that will stand up and uh, boycott a restaurant. Asian Americans as a whole is not a unified group. You have Filipinos, you have Koreans. We don't necess necessarily support each other. So until businesses and uh, studios recognize us as a unified group, we're not gonna have the power to influence um, commercials or purchases or whatever. So that is something that we have to start thinking about. How, how do we get recognized as a financial power? Do you have a question for the panel? Um, their thoughts on it, mostly. There are groups that are trying to do that. I mean, there's like, a, there's Asians in the media. Guy Aoki's group has been around, I'd say, for 15 years at least, you know. It's just, it's, there's, you know, and they boycott things, they write letters, they meet with studio heads or studio people in the studios to talk about projects, but it's not, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. I will say something, I know some of these guys. You guys want to make money, don't you? 
Yeah. You know, sure. Don't need it. Out. <laughs> Don't need it. I think people want to tell stories. They want to be creative. They want to, you know, there's a lot of things that they want to do. But I think they also want to make money. So I know this is a, a struggle. It's not just that Asian American filmmakers or Asian American creatives are dealing with. Actually, with the digital revolution, everybody's trying to figure out how to make money right now because the whole system is changing. Um, do we have time for one more question? Okay, we'll take one more right behind you. And tell us who you are. I'm an old woman, <laughs> and, and I, I find these questions fascinating. And you talk about Asian American. When people, by and large, refer to, let's say, South America, it, it's like one lump without differentiating the extraordinary individuality of each nation. And I would like to see the, the intersection of Asian American with the differentiation and the fascinating history and background of each one of the nations, so it isn't one lump, and how you can make them both work as a, as a form to, you know, to solidify unified action versus really getting to know the different cultures of Asia or Latin America or Africa. It's another one that gets lumped. Does anyone want to talk about that issue? Because I know it's something we struggle with when we talk about Asian American identity. When do we stand together and when do we stand apart? You know? and part of it has to do with the different issues that different communities face. The Cambodian community and the Cambodian students face a different issue than the Japanese American students just because of how they came to the country, the Vietnamese community. And so there's certain issues that they have to deal with. Um, uh, they feel they have, to, they have to deal with, you know. But it, the umbrella is Asian American, but underneath that, there are, there's all different, if you want, on, even on a campus, there's different courses, there's different youth student groups, and it's given them sort of a, 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 a protective umbrella, and then they, these groups form underneath. And even on campuses, it's hard to get unity under the umbrella for an Asian American cause, because each group is really struggling with their own cultural, personal identity. You know, so a lot of it has to do with how they came to America, how America has treated their history and their culture, how they might have been robbed of their own personal historical heroes because they were on the wrong side of the war. You know, so it's, it's you have to, res I have to respect that um, different communities have different issues. And when I started acting, because there were no Cambodian stories being told or no Vietnamese or no Korean or no, you know, I started doing those characters, but I would, go into the communities and record people, record accents, record, you know, run my monologue past community groups to make sure that, um, you know, I was on, key, I was on point. Um, and I think that's something to, to be specific about whatever you're, you're portraying, to be respectful and to be truthful is, is truly important. Well, with that, I think we're running out of time. I want to thank all our panelists today. Thank you for your, your great Maybe questions. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>